1942, moviegoers were surprised to learn that Cary Grant, the former vaudevillian who had worked since he was a boy of 14, had married one of the world's richest women, Barbara Hutton. Critics suggested he was after her money. He was known then as Cash and Carry, a phrase which was to wound him for years. What had not been realized, he had inserted in the marriage arrangements. Whatever happened, he was in no way to benefit from her fortune. In 1944, Carey risked the greatest departure he would ever make from his image, to play a character whose world could have been that of Archie Leach. The film was none but the lonely heart. Anything in the shop needs mending, Ma? No one that needs your help, Bernie Sweet. Carrie was a man of infinite experimentation with his own character. I mean to do my best by you, Ma, love. Happy couple, aren't we? He was constantly striving, it seemed to me, to become better. Peace. That's what us millions want. Not having to snatch it from the smaller dogs. Peace to be not a hound and not a hare. But peace with pride to have a decent human life. Unfortunately, the roles that he ventured out on, such as None But The Lonely Heart, were not his most successful pictures. And I think it made him step back a little bit from playing real character parts. Though critics praised None But The Lonely Heart, and he received his second Academy Award nomination, Carey measured success by box office results, and there the film was a disappointment. In his private life, Carey would also suffer a sense of failure. In 1945, after three years of marriage, Barbara Hutton sued for divorce. She had a lot of titled friends, and they would come to their house for dinner, and Carrie would sit through the dinner, but he didn't really, she said he didn't feel at ease with these title people. And that uh, immediately after dinner, he'd go up to his room upstairs and turn on the radio. But it must have been a great turmoil inside him because he manufactured himself into this great idol from a man who had a very difficult background. The following year, in Hitchcock's Notorious, Carey played a disillusioned secret agent who falls deeply in love in spite of himself. A man doesn't tell a woman what to do, she tells herself. You almost had me believing in that little hokey-pokey miracle of yours, that a woman like you could ever change her spots. Oh, you rotten. That's why I didn't try to stop you. The answer had to come from you. Oh, you never believed in me anyway, so what's the difference? It wouldn't have been pretty if I believed in you, if I'd figured she'd been made over by love. Listen, you chalked up another boyfriend, that's all. No harm done. I hate you. There's no occasion to. You're doing good work. With Ingrid Bergman, Carey created a romantic screen partnership that became legendary. Oh, you love me. Why didn't you tell me before? I know. But I couldn't see straight or think straight. I was a fat-headed guy, full of pain. It tore me up not having you. Oh, you love me. I met Carey, working on the RKO a lot, after he made Notorious. He was very genial, easy to approach. He told me of his great, amb his great ambition at the time was to own a freighter and just kind of drift around the world. And I said to him, Carrie, why don't you do it? And he said, maybe someday I will, and then I'll live the life I want to. On another kind of sea voyage, during one of his frequent trips to Europe, Carrie met an aspiring actress, Betsy Drake. Well, do you mean you're going to deliberately set out to trap him? Well, I know it's dreadful, but this is the kind of thing men force us to do. Why have you been chasing after me for the past two weeks? You? 
Really, Dr. Brown, I've heard of conceited in my time, but you absolutely take the cake. And you'll know just how many candles go on it. <laughs> Betsy and Carrie were married the following year, 1949. Carrie's sense of what would be right for him at the box office had generally proved correct. But when some of his films were less than successful, Carrie thought it might be time to retire. Betsy was opening new worlds to him in philosophy and in self-knowledge, and at last he was able to fulfill his ambition. Together they took tramp steamers to explore distant ports, and more than ever, the private Cary Grant seemed to resemble the image he had created on the screen. But if he wondered whether to enter permanent retirement, the question was answered by Alfred Hitchcock. The film was the 1955 To Catch a Thief. Who brought you up here? The police. We would have caught you, too. My dress hadn't gotten caught all over the steering wheel and gear shift. It was only 20 minutes ago I said goodbye. As quickly as you could. Didn't I thank you? Politely. Well, then. Oh, John, you left in such a hurry you almost ran. I had work to do up here. Were you afraid to admit that you just can't do everything by yourself? Gary liked his partners to be distinguished ladies. He chose always women who had a certain breeding. It was very important to him. I think he was very, very fond of uh, Ingrid Bergman and Grace Kelly. Cary Grant and this year's Academy Award winner, Grace Kelly, two exciting personalities who were made for each other. He liked his uh, partners to be tall, slim, to wear jewels beautifully. Look, John. Hold them. Diamonds. Have you ever had a better offer in your whole life? One with everything. With his leading ladies, he had this wonderful rapport, courtesy and tenderness, but with a great deal of humor, just like on the screen. It was really very pleasant. It was like <clears throat> going out with a gentleman. I guess I'm not the lone wolf I thought I was, Francis. Well, I, I just wanted to hear you say that. known quite a few and I suppose they've all been madly in love with you I doubt it but uh, you haven't had much respect for them no, on the contrary still you've always been very fair in your judgments yes I've been more than fair I idealize them every woman I meet I put up there even when he was having fun and laughing and making jokes at which he was excellent at he was still there was still this remoteness there was still this keeping something a secret. Winter must be cold for those with no warm memories. We've already missed the spring. Yes. Well, this is probably my last chance. Mine too. It's now or never. There was a, a most unexpected vulnerability in Kerry. If I said fear, that wouldn't be right. But he was wary of relationships with women. I just want to be worthy of asking you to marry me. <clears throat> oh, Nicky, that's just about the nicest. Your voice cracked. Oh, well, that's because I... Yes, I know, I know. And that didn't stop him from loving all his leading ladies. And by loving, I mean he was fond. It's the biggest night of the year in Hollywood as Oscar steps into the spotlight for the 29th time. By now, Carrie made a point of avoiding most public events. 
But in 1957, he agreed to accept the Academy Award on behalf of Ingrid Bergman for her performance in Anastasia. One by Ingrid Bergman, accepted on her behalf by Cary Grant. When most of Hollywood turned against Ingrid for leaving her husband and child for director Roberto Rossellini, Cary remained one of her staunchest friends. In 1958, Indiscreet brought these old friends together again. What do you mean? I mean, we'll go on as before. And not be married? That's right. Well, that's the most improper thing I ever heard. What? I can hardly believe my ears. But what, what are you so shocked about? I didn't think you were capable of it. But what is different? We are not married. We were before. But you didn't know I wasn't married. You knew. I knew you didn't know. What's the matter with you? How could you ask me to do such a thing? Haven't you been following what I've been saying? Oh, I tell you, women are not the sensitive sex. That's one of the great delusions of literature. Men are the true romanticists. And... <laughs> what are you crying about? Oh, shut up, <laughs> Don't cry, Anna. I'd love you. Everything will be all right. You'll like being married. You will. You'll see. It was 1958. For over 25 years, Cary Grant had been everybody's favorite leading man. You know, the, the man that every woman would like to love and that every man would like to be. And he played that part over and over again and played it beautifully. In many ways, the best was yet to come. With the 1959 Hitchcock classic, North by Northwest, Cary Grant's career seemed to have found its jewel. I'm an advertising man, not a red herring. I've got a job, a secretary, a mother, two ex-wives, and several bartenders dependent upon me. And I don't intend to disappoint them all by getting myself slightly killed. Cary Grant, running for his life, searching for a man who doesn't exist, and a secret nobody knows, and finding a blonde who has all the answers. Hello there. Tell me, why are you so good to me? Shall I climb up and tell you why? I was fascinated by the combination of Alfred Hitchcock and Cary Grant because although they were very different in the facade, they were very classy gentlemen. Very classy. The moment I meet an attractive woman, I have to start pretending I have no desire to make love to her. What makes you think you have to conceal it? She might find the idea objectionable. Then again, she might not. Think how lucky I am to have been seated here. Well, luck has nothing to do with it. Fate? I tipped the steward five dollars to seat you here if you should come in. I just found him to be a very giving actor. And he, you, you just always felt that he was with you every minute, not only for his close-ups, but for your close-ups. I had the feeling that he was very happy I was working with him. And when he talked with me, I felt at that moment I was the only woman in the whole wide world. And when I would be with him, the rush of the people, I was almost frightened by it. Because although people recognized me, it wasn't that incredible, uh, adoring feeling that they had for him. He felt imposed upon sometimes by crowds, um, and yet I never knew anyone who could behave as well as he did in a crowd. Actually, if you asked almost any man in those days who would he like to be, you'd often get the answer Cary Grant, much more often than you would get the answer the President of the United States. By the way, he charged 25 cents per autograph. One of the things we used to tease him about was that he was very careful with money. Oh, he was renowned, you know, for never sending flowers at Christmas or presents at Christmas. I never received a Christmas present from him. And he told the people it went to the Actors Fund. But I received presents from him, gifts, 
Not because it was Christmas, but because it was Tuesday, or Monday, or some other day. And I was afraid to do that myself because I was just, uh, well, I wasn't sure they'd come up with the 25 cents. <laughs> In 1959, Carey had another huge hit, if not with the critics, then certainly with audiences, Operation Petticoat. It would be his highest grossing picture. Women! Wow! Um, now, uh, for the next few days, we'll all be living in fairly close contact with each other. Excuse me. Now, you being women and the... Uh, the men, that is, the, the crew being men, well... What are you going to do about it, sir? I know it works, doesn't it? Yeah, but I'm here all day. That thing going up and down? That's undecent. Um, well, what I mean to say... We know what you mean to say, Captain. We're well acquainted with the facts of life. Uh, so are the men, Major. I simply try to avoid any exchange of information. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Holden's been showing me around, explaining how everything works. Now, uh, he's been explaining. We're just on our way to the maneuvering room. Now, I'm afraid Mr. Holden won't be able to maneuver this morning. Don't you have a book to read? Uh, yes, sir. I'm on Chapter 5, actually. Uh, Care and Operation of the Bilge Pump. Oh, that's nice. I can't wait to see how it turns out. Oh, you'll like it. It turns out happily. They get each other in the end. 28 of Carey's films opened at New York's largest and most prestigious theater, Radio City. He was again and again acknowledged as the movie house's top box office draw. When he exhibited himself, he was Cary Grant, the handsome, leading man, star incarnate. Favorite movie star and box office champion. Grant never gave the appearance of being commercial, and he was probably as commercial an actor who's ever lived. Now the producer of his own films, Cary knew the value of publicity. But when he cooperated, it was in his own way. He would say, let the public and the press know nothing but your public self. A star is best left mysterious and just show your work on film and let the publicity people do the rest. In 1961, Robert Mitchum, Deborah Carr and Gene Simmons appeared with Carrie in The Grass is Greener. The film's director was Stanley Donnan. He played the part of a husband whose wife cheats on him or wants to cheat on him. The man understood that she might have had some desire for this other man. He's not just another man, darling. He's a millionaire. Darling, you see my Bible anywhere? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were alone. Uh, isn't it by your bed? No, it isn't. You're off in the press, are you? No, I'm not. Well, you've got a camera. You just took a photograph. Mr. Delacroix is an American. Oh, I see. I thought you were from good housekeeping or something. And, of course, in that story, as perhaps in life it could happen that way, when he said to her, go ahead and do it, the thrill was gone. So I can only suggest that we declare a sort of moratorium. How do you mean? An armistice, an intermission, call it what you like. Whatever you do, you do. If you decide to go off with him, I'll just have to wait here until you get back. And he won her back. You mean you'd be willing to do that? Uh, that was a lot of carry in that. After a prolonged separation, Betsy Drake divorced Carrie in 1962. The marriage had lasted 13 years, and they would remain friends to the end of Carrie's life. By 1963, Carey had enacted the role of leading man for over 30 years. Now he was approaching his 60th birthday. One more time, darling. Where is it? Your husband was mixed up in something. What was it? Any minute now, we could be assassinated. Mr. Mother, Mr. Mother, you. Help me! Reggie, stop! Oh, I don't know who anybody is. Reggie, I beg you. Just trust me once more. Why should I? I can't think of a reason in the world why you should. 
when we made charade, he was concerned that the age difference uh, between Audrey Hepburn and Carrie and himself was too great. Here you are. Where? On the street where you live. How about once more around the park? How about getting out of here? Come on, child, out. Won't you come in for a minute? No, I won't. I don't bite, you know, unless it's called for. How would you like a spanking? How would you like a punch in the nose? Stop treating me like a child. Well, then stop behaving like one. Do you know what's wrong with you? No, what? Nothing. And I thought Carrie and Audrey were as romantic a couple as you would ever find in a movie. I still believe that. I think the picture today, if you look at it, one of the joys is just those two people in that movie. Hey, you don't look so bad in this light. So why do you think I brought you here? I thought maybe you wanted me to see the kind of work the competition was turning out. Pretty good, huh? Mm. I taught them everything they do. Oh, did they do that kind of thing way back in your day? Sure. How do you think I got here? Not allowed to kiss back, huh? Oh, no. Doctor said it was bad for my thermostat. Come on, you come on, don't you? Well, come on. Cary Grant had this image of a very suave, sophisticated man, considered the most brilliant comedian in Hollywood. By the time Cary Grant came to shoot Father Goose, he wanted to change his image. Mr. Eklund is a rude, foul-mouthed, drunken, filthy beast. Well, be that as it may. This is a filthy beast speaking. If you think I'd want to get involved with an undisciplined, self-indulgent escapist like you... Well, that's better than be a frustrated spinster. What was he like? She who? The lady who drove you to this. Drove me to what? Drink. Oh, there was no lady. That was your wife. <laughs> I think he was quite disappointed when the public didn't... Uh, didn't uh, want Cary Grant to be with a beard and sloppy and say a few dirty words. That was upsetting for him. And he uh, uh, gave up soon after that and retired. There were lots of children on the film. He was very interested in children. Leave it alone! Leave it alone! Drink something. Give him something to drink. Quick. Drink. <coughs> you hold it. <laughs> Kenny! <clears throat> well, how strange. Why? That you should bring me this. I've done it before. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. Shut up. <clears throat> he was uh, always asking me about mine and how I raised them. He had a, a very paternal attitude towards children. It was rather touching. As a matter of fact, he was courting Dan Cannon during the film, and it's soon after the film that they married, and she uh, gave him a child. That was the happiest thing in his life. It's also the only occasion when he departed from our normal agreement. We had always promised that we would never go to talk to his mother about anything to do with him. But suddenly, he asked us, would we take a wire picture so she could see her new grandchild? Walk, Don't Run was released the same year that Jennifer was born, 1966. But this time, Kerry did not play the leading man. He had made 72 films. And this would be his last. He told me, look, I've produced 
Jennifer, the most marvelous girl in the world. What could compare with that? Certainly no movie. Carrie's marriage to Diane Cannon was soon headed for the divorce courts. But Carrie's devotion to his daughter was unwavering. As if recalling the unhappiness of his own childhood, Carey was determined his daughter would never, for a single moment, doubt his love for her. In 1970, Cary Grant received an honorary Academy Award for nearly 35 years of achievement. At last, the Academy was paying tribute to one of Hollywood's greatest stars. He no longer appeared on the screen, but even as he aged, the Cary Grant legend continued to grow. He joined the board of major corporations. He addressed the 1976 Republican Convention. To introduce to you and to the nation, the president's first and our first lady, Betty Ford. Hi. He received one of his adopted country's highest honors, presented by an old Hollywood friend. Although at the time he ran off to be an acrobat, he was known as Archie Leach. Some actors had to change their names to become successful. Others didn't. <laughs> the eager young vaudevillian from Bristol had indeed come a long way. But always it was the public Cary Grant on display. The private man still kept himself beyond reach. I think he was somebody who uh, liked a very quiet life and probably liked eating in the kitchen better than at uh, Maxime's. In 1981, he proved that in real life, he was still the leading man and could still win the beautiful girl. At 77, Carrie married a young English woman, Barbara Harris. The extraordinary thing about Carrie is that he became nobler looking in age. I'm not talking about handsomeness. I'm talking about the thing that's called soul. He grew when, with maturity, he got to know himself better, probably, as we all do. It seemed that Carey had at last found the family he yearned for, and with it, a way to deal with the old, unhappy memories. Just three years before his death, the wheel had turned full circle. A lady colleague of mine took him on a tour of Bristol. He spoke of the Saturday mornings. His mother took him shopping. He pointed out the cinema where he'd seen his first pearl white serials and even insisted on being taken to his favorite fish and chip shop. At the end of it all, he told me I wish she'd asked me more. I was enjoying it so much. At that moment, I felt at last Archie Leach had come happily home. The Hippodrome Theater, where it had all started. A call from Kelly was always an event. That voice was unmistakable. Gary said, John, I'm going to do kind of a variation on that series that you once wanted me to do. I'm just going to do it around a few little places, show a few film clips, and then just talk to the people. It was a total departure for him. There was no prepared script. It was billed simply as a conversation with Cary Grant. It was that, not with the image, the creation, the persona. The public and the private man, they were at last one and the same. He died, I'm told, talking about himself, answering any of the questions that any of the sometimes impertinent newspaper people asked him about his private life, about his loves. And I think it's kind of a realization that he came to that he belonged to the public. Even though he withdrew from them, he was still theirs, and I think he always will be. 
and from Archie Leach to Cary Grant. What a giant step. And yet he became Cary Grant. He really became him. He sort of said, I actually have grown into the person that I wanted to be.